Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. The recent Taliban victory in Afghanistan and the abrupt American withdrawal are only the most dramatic evidence of a profound realignment in the politics of the Middle East. For months, former enemies have been talking to each other. The Israelis are no longer pariahs in at least some of the region. Military confrontation seems to have taken a back seat in rhetoric and in fact, to economic cooperation. Iran sits at the center of this emerging new reality. Rapprochement among Arabs and peace with Israel is one thing if it is aimed at a united front against Iran, but quite another if it is about finding new ways to work with Iran on common objectives. That would be new thinking for a new world. How are these developments seen in Iran? What kind of Middle East do the leaders of that country, including the newly elected President Ebrahim Raisi, want, and what are they prepared to do to get it? My guest today, a former Iranian diplomat and top advisor on nuclear and foreign policy, is as well positioned as anyone to answer those questions. Ambassador Sayed Hossein Musavian is Middle East Security and Nuclear Policy Specialist at Princeton University and a former chief of Iran's National Security Foreign Relations Committee. Welcome, Hossein. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Let's start at the meta level. Speaking of the Middle East, you recently wrote, quote, we have reached the end of the era of American regional dominance, unquote, and argued that an axis among Beijing, Moscow, and Tehran could fill that gap. That's one model. Another model envisions Iranian Arab cooperation without much role for non-regional states. Are those two models in contradiction? Actually, uh, Alan, it could be in contradiction and and also it could not be. If there is a regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf based on Resolution 598, which has given mandate to Secretary General to talk to eight countries around the Persian Gulf, Iran, Saudi Arabia, GCC countries and Iraq about uh, a security and cooperation system in the Persian Gulf. If the UN Security Council is going to uh, activate this resolution and give a mandate to the Secretary General to start such a, a regional forum, such a forum for a regional dialogue, then we would have both. We would have a, a regional cooperation system and negotiation between Iran and the regional countries to settle the crisis. However, we would have the supervision of the five permanent member of United Nations Security Council, the US, Russia, China, France, and UK. Therefore, it depends if the U.S. is going to com- confront Iran. If the U.S. allies uh, and the U.S. are going to continue the united front to fight Iran, Iran definitely would continue to strengthen the relation with the Eastern Bloc like Russia and China. Therefore, this would be a, somehow a confrontational policy between Eastern Bloc the U.S., Europe, and their allies. But the other option, I believe, always I have advocated, I have written the new book. The name is The New Security and Cooperation Structure in the Persian Gulf. I have introduced a very comprehensive roadmap how this can work to resolve the regional issues, how this can work to have a united supervision by United Nations Security Council, which would include the U.S., Russia, China, and then 
we would leave everything more to the regional countries rather than to, to, to interference of the superpowers, whether this is UK or US or China or Russia. Facts on the ground are moving pretty fast, as you know. There was recently a summit in Baghdad, ranking officials of Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, uh, the Emirates, other Gulf countries met uh, at the invitation of the Iraqis. Uh, I think that's the first broadest regional summit in, in at least recent memory. Um, was it significant? What do you think happens next? Interestingly, it was not, although the French were there, President Macron was there. Um, I don't think it was under the flag of the United Nations. It was rather under the flag of, of the region itself. I think it was a positive move, although the the subject the objective was not to create a regional platform for negotiating, discussing the regional issues. The main objective was to support Iraq by the regional countries and the international powers. Uh, however, uh, yes, it was a gathering. The regional countries like Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, they attended at high level. But it was more about how they can support Iraq and fight uh, the, the terrorism in Iraq, the economic uh, crisis uh, to help the, to, to resolve the economic crisis in Iraq. The focus was on Iraq. The focus was not on uh, a, a broader regional uh, issue, but it could be say I, I can say this was a good first step. First step in terms of starting serious conversations at serious levels among the parties in in the region themselves, as opposed to intermediated by the Americans or the Chinese or or, or whomever. See. Uh, Alan, I would say if we are going to count on regional uh, 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 advancement, regional issues, I believe that the negotiation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, direct negotiations, which they have already started, three rounds of negotiations have been already taken place. They are supposed to have the fourth round. I believe rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia would be the first and the most important step uh, to, to uh, improve Iran-Arab relations. If Iran and Saudi Arabia, they can uh, have uh, success in these negotiations, then Iran-GCC uh, relation would be improved. If Iran GCC would have improved, then Iraq is ready for a regional cooperation and security system. Iran is ready. GCC also would be involved. Then this would be a big uh, start, a good start for uh, uh, for negotiating, discussing, for establishing a new structure for regional cooperation and security, which Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iranians, Arabs, they would be involved. And if we can have the support of United Nations Security Council, then I believe this would be the right way to start and to go ahead. So you've just described, I, I don't like the domino metaphor, but a whole series of things that could build on each other to get to somewhere better than we have been. But at the start of it, as you said, is the Saudi-Iranian relationship. What would it take for that relationship uh, to change from what it's been in the last years? Who needs to do what? Actually, uh, Iran and Saudis, they experienced a, a relatively good relation from 1996 to 2005 for about 10 years. It was we had the same hostility, we had the same problem with Saudis before 1996. And uh, then uh, Crown Prince uh, Amir Abdullah with, met with Rafsanjani and Rafsanjani uh, agreed to send a special envoy, which I was that time ambassador to Germany. Uh, the then Iranian president Ayatollah Rafsanjani wanted me to go to negotiate to with uh, uh, King Abdullah, I went to Jeddah for four nights uh, from 11, 12 uh, p.m. 
till five o'clock in the morning. We had a long conversation together and we agreed on a very comprehensive package on bilateral relations, political security, uh, economic relations, everything. That time, uh, it was Saddam era. And when I raised with King Abdullah uh, to, to, to start the same package for uh, regional cooperation and regional issues, he told me we have two problems. One problem is Saddam, which neither you nor us, we can sit with him. And the second problem is the U.S., which the U.S. doesn't like Iran and Saudi Arabia to go to bed together. That's why uh, that time we could manage the bilateral relations. It worked for 10 years, but we couldn't start a regional uh, momentum between Iran and Saudi Arabia. As he said, one problem was Saddam. The second problem was the U.S. But now I believe Saddam, definitely Saddam is gone, no doubt. Uh, Iraq is a new Iraq and which would like to have a good relation with U.S., with Iran, with Russia, with China, with Saudi Arabia. This is what Iraqis they really want. And uh, I believe uh, Biden administration uh, is really serious to get out of the region and to focus on the big powers like India, like China, like Russia, and to, to save the U.S. from the quagmire of Persian Gulf and Middle East. I think he is serious. Uh, Afghanistan issue was a case which uh, he showed how serious he is. And despite of all damages and consequences, he wants just to get the U.S. out of the region. If this is so, I, I think uh, Biden administration would be positive to support Iran's Saudi rapprochement. If so, then already Russia, China, Europe publicly, officially has announced, they have announced that they are supporting the idea, the initiative of a regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf, which would engulf Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and other GCC countries. Europe, Russia, China, uh, they all have already stated their readiness. In our region, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, Iran, Iraq, they have uh, already publicly said they are ready to support. Therefore, five countries out of eight countries, they are ready to support. I believe if Biden would take uh, positive gestures seriously, Saudi Arabia also would come, Bahrain and Emirates, they would come. Then we would have a major breakthrough in this region. Let me ask about two elephants in that room. One is Israel, one is nuclear. Uh, start with Israel because one of the surprises of the recent past, of course, has been, as I mentioned earlier, the rapprochement between Israel and the Emirates and Morocco and several other states, not the Saudis, but, but several other states. And clearly Israel under Prime Minister Bennett is a somewhat different Israel, at least potentially, than under Prime Minister Netanyahu. We could debate that. But nonetheless, there is a question in the region, what, what is the role of Israel if the Arab states are prepared to work in some ways economically, maybe even other, other dimensions with Israel? How does that affect the structure that you have been talking about? I believe uh, the world powers should focus on, uh, on the Israeli issue, they should focus for implementation of all UN resolutions to settle Israeli-Palestinian crisis. We have this crisis for 70 years. We have uh, multiple resolutions. And frankly speaking, Israelis, they have violated every resolution of United Nations during the last 50, 60 years. Therefore, this is, uh, I mean, they are responsible uh, the UN Security Council is responsible for implementation of UN resolutions. None of the resolutions have been implemented by Israelis. That's why this crisis is going for 70 years. And today we are in the worst uh, situation of the crisis between Israelis and Palestinians. 
this is something I believe they should uh, try to under to make Israelis understand the first priority for peace and stability in this region is this old problem, which is the mother of the problem of the Middle East, is Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Then we are coming to the second part of the problem, which is between Iranian and Arabs. We have already discussed how the second problem can be resolved. But you would say that even between Iranian and Arabs, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and GCC, you may have dispute over the nuclear issue. I would say yes. But within the regional cooperation system in the Persian Gulf, one of the principles could be agreed between eight countries in the Persian Gulf is nuclear weapon free zone in Persian Gulf. The second issue could be agreed is about uh, Persian Gulf free of all weapons of mass destruction, whether this is nuclear or chemical or biological. The third issue they can agree is about a new arrangement for conventional arms in this region. Therefore, they have a good venue to go forward with resolving the disputes between Iran and the Arabs in the Persian Gulf. And if the world powers would try is to push Israelis for implementation of uh, the resolutions related to Palestinian crisis, and then I believe that would be extremely important for the world powers to push and to pressure Israelis for nuclear weapon free zone in the in the Middle East, because Alan, look, frankly speaking. Israel is the only country which has not accepted a uh, non-proliferation treaty. Israel is the only country possess uh, over 200 nuclear bombs. And all pressures from the U.S. is on nuclear issue, is on Iran, which is a member of NPT and does not have nuclear bomb, as, and is the most inspected country on nuclear in the history of non-proliferation. This dual policy, double standards, is really killing the problems in the Middle East. I mean, it's a killing problem. Because it, as long as you have double standards by the superpowers, you are not going to resolve anything. If this is nuclear, I have said we can arrange a nuclear weapon free zone in the Persian Gulf. You can discuss every issues related to missile, uh, nuclear, uh, conventional arms. Uh, unconventional arms between Iran and Arabs. But if you are going to leave Palestinians, Palestinian crisis to go on, like se last 70 years, and if you are going to give carte blanche for Israelis to possess and to keep their nuclear bombs, then you are not going to have nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East while you have for 50 years these super powers, they have uh, 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 passed and ratified multiple resolutions for nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East while they know there is only one country should give up the nuclear bombs. Therefore, I think sending and, uh, uh, and diverting every problem in this region on Iran, that's why we have never been able to resolve. That's why the Palestinian problems is not resolved. That's why the nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East has not been realized. That's why WMD free zone in the Middle East has never been realized. That's why you have not been able to implement any of UN resolutions in this region. That's all true. Uh, but the key word that you used was if. And as I look around uh, the world, I see very little pressure on either of those issues. Um, indeed, uh, any serious negotiation on the Palestinian issue has not happened for many years. And any serious pressure on the Israelis' nuclear capacity hasn't happened ever, I don't think. And we are where we are. And that's why I asked the question at the start, um, the Abraham Accords, so-called, uh, seem to point in a different direction. The Baghdad summit started a process, the Saudi-Iranian conversation started a process, but none of those initiatives are predicated on 
implementation of the UN resolutions with regard to the Palestinians. In fact, it's not even discussed very widely, and none of them are predicated on a nuclear-free zone in the region. So I ask again, will these initiatives- Alan, I believe, I believe this type of diplomatic relations is with the, some Arab uh, governments would not resolve the uh, Israeli-Arab problems. Because first of all, you have Arab nation, you have hundreds of millions of Muslims, which you would not be able to convince them for continuation of occupation of Palestine, uh, Muslim land, Muslim country. And uh, at the same time, you would think you can resolve all these crises with a diplomatic relation with some Arab states, which they uh, actually uh, are not democratic states, you know, and you know they have no face and cred credibility between the Muslim nations in internationally, I mean, in the world. I mean, this is another issue. Israelis, they, they think if they would buy if they would employ this emir on that, that, that king, they would be able to resolve their problem in this region. No, this is not going to be a sustainable solution. However, if the world powers, as you say, and I agree, they are not serious about Palestinian-Israeli crisis, if the world powers, they do not want to execute the, 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 the UN resolutions in regard to Palestinian crisis, in regard to nuclear weapon free zone, in regard to WMD free zone because of Israelis, then at least they can support for implementation of other resolutions like resolution 2231, which is related to Iranian nuclear issue. At least America can and should respect the UN resolutions 2231, which are already agreed. And then also they can revive and implement resolution 598 to resolve part of the issues between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Arab countries, and the problem in the Persian Gulf. You cannot solve all the issues at one night altogether. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, Please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. Let's talk briefly about something that you are one of the, the very knowledgeable people in the world, which is the Iranian nuclear negotiations. Um, they are currently in abeyance as the new Iranian government gets organized. Is it fair to ask whether you think the basis exists for eventual negotiations to succeed? The base, Alan, already exists. The UN Security Council is the highest body internationally responsible for maintaining peace and security in the world. And on the nuclear issue, we have resolution 231 adopting, adopted already to support the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. The base is there. <clears throat> the, the second base is uh, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which the Board of Governors also, they have adopted the, the deal. Therefore, the two most important international bodies they have adopted and we have international rules and regulations which is jcpoa nuclear deal which is resolution 2231 the question is whether the united states of america is going to respect and to implement the un resolution or not this is the big question second the problem today is that since President Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal, while Iran was in full implementation and full compliance for three years from 2015 to 2018, President Trump withdrew, violated the nuclear deal, and reimposed all sanctions. Now, on the negotiation table, Iranians, they are asking Americans, what? is your assurance that again your next president would not withdraw 
how we can have a sustainable deal. If the U.S. would be free to withdraw from this deal every day they decide, then this would not be a sustainable deal. How do you expect Iran permanently implement the resolution while the U.S. is not ready to implement the resolution? The U.S. has nothing to say, no guarantee, no assurances that even if the U.S. joined the Biden administration, joined the deal, they would implement it in the future. They are not ready to give any assurances. This is one issue, one problem. And the second problem is that the U.S. is going to link implementation of the nuclear deal to the regional issues, which is not part of the JCPOA. Therefore, the U.S. is asking for a new deal, which is not part of Resolution 2231. However, the reality is that we have the regional crisis and regional problems. To my understanding, the best venue for the regional issues is between Iranian and Saudis, Arabs, Persian Gulf, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, all these issues, which is more between Iranian and the Arabs, I believe they can resolve, they can negotiate, they can cooperate within the uh, regional uh, security and cooperation system, which I already explained. Therefore, we can have a venue for regional negotiations between the regional countries with the supervision of United Nations Security Council, which the United States is a member. But the nuclear deal should be implemented as is. And if you want to have a sustainable deal, the parties, they should promise it is not going to happen again what happened during President Trump. Otherwise, if you expect only one party full compliance and no other party give any assurances about full compliance, then this is not compliance for compliance. But you know the country, the United States, well. You have worked here for a number of years. You know many of our, you know our systems, the U.S. systems and processes. Is such a guarantee, what would such a guarantee look like? Even, even if you are talking about the U.S. system, if a treaty is ratified by the Congress, nobody can be sure that the Congress would not change its decision later, you know. The system is really vulnerable about decision-making and giving assurance to international communities that if they decide, they would implement. However, based on UN Charter, Allen, implementation of UN resolutions are mandatory for every member of United Nations. And already the U.S. Congress has ratified membership of United States in the United Nations and the U.N. Charter. This is already a, a Congress ratification. And based on this charter, United States and every other member of United Nations, they are uh, mandated, this is mandatory for them to implement the U.N. resolutions. Would be this enough for a legal platform to secure the implementation of the UN resolution? If not, then you may discuss that, yes, President Biden would join. And in the future, if there is any discrepancy in implementation by, by any other member, you would refer the case to International Court of Justice, which is, again, UN uh, body to decide. But we both know, and you've already pointed out, that there are many uh, UN resolutions that are mandated but are not, in yes. fact, executed. And indeed, one can make the case, but we'll have to do it in our next conversation, that we need to rethink the global governance framework because it clearly is not, is not as effective as you or many would want because those, those resolutions aren't executed. But let me switch gears and just ask one last question, which goes back to an issue I mentioned at the start, which is the Taliban in Afghanistan. Iran shares a 500 kilometer border 
actually longer than that, I suppose, a 900 kilometer border. Yes, it's about 900, yeah. With, with Afghanistan. Um, so you have, you have skin in the game. You care a lot about a stable Afghanistan. You host something on the order of 3 million Afghan refugees already, um, numbers that go up and down, but, but ten, could, could well go up in a, in a very unstable situation in Afghanistan. Um, what do you see? Yes, you are completely right. Iran uh, has a very important national security uh, issues uh, because of hundreds of kilometers of common borders, because of the war in Afghanistan for about 40 years or even over 40 years because of the refugees, because of drug trafficking, because of terrorism, because of instability, because of money laundering, because of a lot of problems. And the Iranians, they have been hosting hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, Afghanis for 40 years. I mean, this is a huge uh, humanitarian contribution Iran has made to the neighbor. However, it is really, uh, Alan, interesting to review a very, very short and summarized review. In 2001, when the U.S. invited Iran to cooperate to fight Al-Qaeda Taliban, Iran cooperated, and only because of uh, Iran-U.S. cooperation, Taliban was defeated. And the U.S. could enter, the, US, the American military could enter uh, Kabul, and then we had bond conference for political, new political uh, establishment, and then Iran-U.S., they really cooperated for a new uh, political structure in Afghanistan. But immediately after such a uh, unprecedented cooperation, when President Bush labeled Iran as axis of evil, uh, as a reward to Iranian cooperation fighting war on terror in Afghanistan, then Iranians, they left Americans alone with Taliban. Because the U.S. wanted actually to isolate Iran. And they said, OK, thank you. Goodbye. We leave you with Taliban. And then the U.S. allies, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, they supported by Taliban. And that's why for 20 years, the U.S. was fighting with Taliban. The, the government was fighting with Taliban. And from the other side, Taliban was supported by the U.S. allies, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and some other Arab countries. And practically at the end, uh, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the United States, they cooperated to defeat the United States in, Saudi, in Afghanistan. You know, the U.S. was defeated by its own allies, not by Iran. Now, Taliban has been reality. The day President Bush uh, labeled Iran as axis of evil and wanted Iranian to leave Afghanistan in 2001, and Iranian, they left the U.S. Uh, along with Taliban. They established a new channel with Taliban. Iranian Taliban channel has worked, uh, Taliban channel has worked for over 20 years. The, it, this is not something new. And for 20 years, they decided not to harm each other, to be neutral against each other. And that's why Taliban could focus on, uh, on fighting the U.S. That's why Saudi Pakistani support for Taliban worked. And that's why the U.S. failed and was, was completely defeated. Now, because of 20 years of back channel and confidential relation between Taliban, before they come to, to, to Kabul, they had very serious, important meetings in Tehran. And I, to my understanding, there is a type of uh, uh, agreement and understanding between Iran and Taliban how to work together in order to not to fight, in order to not to have old hostilities and uh, try to help uh, Afghanistan to, to revive Afghanistan and, in, in, uh, and to create an inclusive government. Of course, Iran would, uh, uh, would, would, would agree that Taliban should have a major role in the future governing system of Afghanistan. But Iranians, they are insisting to Taliban and Taliban has accepted. And in Tehran, they announced when they were in Tehran, 
they announced that they have agreed to have inclusive uh, government. If this is so, if Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, uh, they would cooperate, international community they would, would, would cooperate. And if Taliban also would agree to have inclusive government, then you can be optimistic. That is an absolutely wonderful note on which to end this conversation because it is a complicated world and ending with the possibility at least that a very dark chapter in Afghanistan's long dark history could come evolve in a positive way uh, with the region making it happen. Uh, that would indeed be, be, be an accomplishment. That, that, would, that would help a lot of people in a lot of ways. So thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you very much, Alan. As always, I enjoy talking to you. I learn something every time we meet, and I've learned today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>